Good morning, Refuge. We're so blessed to have you here. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to the Refuge at Centenary United Methodist Church. We're glad that you're joining us for worship today. I want to welcome you to our online service. We are closed to in-person worship this Sunday and also next Sunday as well. Before we made the decision to go to online only, I'd already ask our own Nathan Skinner to preach in the Refuge today, and he's going to go ahead and do that, and I'm looking forward to hearing his message. I'll be filling in in the traditional service for Robert today. We'll be beginning our Advent series, Restore. Today we're talking about restoring hope. I know that it's been a difficult year, and we're longing for the message of Christmas and the good news of Jesus to restore our souls again. Some other things that are going on at the church, we have our Angel Tree Ministry. Your donation and honor and memory are in celebration of will go towards ministries here in our community. To give to the Angel Tree, you can look for the form in your church newsletter and bring that back by the office or mail it into the church. On Christmas Eve, we will not have our traditional in-person candlelight service. Instead, we'll be producing a video worship service that you can watch at home with your friends and family on Christmas Eve. It'll be available that afternoon. And at 5.30 at the church, we'll gather in front of the sanctuary outside. We'll sing some Christmas carols together and we'll celebrate the light that has come into the world through Jesus Christ. Hope that you'll join us and make plans for that Christmas Eve service. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. God, we thank you for this day, your presence. We thank you for the times that we had in this past week with thanksgiving and joy. We just pray that you receive that joy in our life, God, and we just give that joy back to you. We prepare our hearts for the Christmas season of Advent and everything that you're doing and going to do in our lives. We love you so much, God. Amen. Let us worship. I was buried beneath my shame who could carry that kind of weight it was my turn until I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Until I met you Cause when you called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glory Cause when you call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Now your mercy has saved so and your freedom is all that I know the old man knew Jesus when I met you shelter my 
I was an orphan, but you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. Good morning and welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. My name is Nathan Skinner and I'll be your pastor today in the refuge service. Thank you so much for joining us. If you would check in on Facebook and let everybody know that I'm your pastor. Uh, as John said in the announcements, he is next door uh, preaching in the traditional service. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. We are going to kick things off by lighting the Advent candle and our scripture today for the Advent candle is Psalm 80, verses 1 through 7. Please listen, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph's descendants like a flock. O God, enthroned above the cherubim, display your radiant glory. To Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, show us your mighty power. Come, rescue us. Turn us again to yourself, O God. Make your face shine down upon us. Only then will we be saved. O Lord God of heaven's armies, how long will you be angry with our prayers? You have fed us with sorrow and made us drink tears by the bucketful. You have made us the scorn of neighboring nations. Our enemies treat us as a joke. Turn us again to yourself, O God of heaven's armies. Make your face shine down upon us. Only then will we be saved. from the sky we would have our hope in Christ we light this candle today to provide a source of light and warmth that guides our paths and points us to Christ the source of hope may it remind us to live our lives as a light in the darkness Oh, 
come thou wisdom from on high who orders all things mighty to us the path of knowledge show and teach us in your ways to go rejoice rejoice Emmanuel shall come to thee O Israel shall come to thee Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel, shall come to thee, O Israel. Rejoice again. I say rejoice, for unto us is born the Savior of the world. Take heart, a weary soul, take heart, for help is on the way, and holy is His name. Rejoice again, I say rejoice. It's a secret. Go back to work. Good morning. I'm Barbara Morgan, current chair of SPRC. And it's been our tradition at Centenary to have a collection at this time of year, Thanksgiving and the Christmas season, for Christmas bonuses for our pastors and staff. You know, pre-pandemic, we were doing great. We had a great number in worship every Sunday. All the missions teams were meeting and working in our community. The youth were very active and doing great projects. And then the pandemic hit. Immediately, Pastor Robert went to the bishop and he went to the mayor of our city to find out how he could conduct worship in a safe manner and make things available for the people of Centenary. And he's done a wonderful job. Immediately, we had online worship with a service every week that was put on video and uh, we've had three drive-through communions, which were wonderful. We had our refuge band and our traditional music, and they combined together to provide a great worship service for us, along with our pastors. In July, Reverend John Hiller came. He hit the ground running. He and Robert have been busy providing not only the weekly service with great music, but also three Bible studies They've done weekly announcements and newsletters. We had youth involved in virtual communication. The uh, confirmation class was made of 11 kiddos who met every Sunday at 6 o'clock faithfully, and they were confirmed just a few weeks ago. Vacation Bible School was held online. Uh, we were able to start Logos a few weeks ago. We've had to stop that for now, but hopefully in the new year that will uh, be started again, and probably all virtually. 
Committees have met faithfully. Quester Sunday School has met weekly in small groups. The missions have been limited, but last summer our youth provided meals for the community. They would bring in sack lunches and the pastors and staff would deliver those to different people in our community. St. John's Mission has been very faithful. They have probably fed over 2,000 people this year by providing sack lunches. And just this week, our men's club has provided 50 Thanksgiving boxes, and they will do so again at Christmas time. The leadership and guidance of our pastors and staff are what have made all these things possible. We could not do it without it. And I want to give a big shout out to Kevin McCartney. He has been so faithful in every video you see, Kevin's standing behind that video. We need to put him in front sometime. So now I would ask you to open your hearts and open your bank account and see what might be appropriate for you to give as a Christmas bonus. You can give online. Just be sure to put Christmas for the staff. You can give by check, same thing, staff Christmas, or you can give by cash. Just put the money in an envelope with your name on it and the amount and Christmas uh, bonus. As usual, we are so grateful for your faithfulness and generosity to Centenary and to each other. And I just want to thank you for that. It's now time for God to receive our offerings. Your giving is an act of worship and makes possible the ministry of changing lives, transforming communities, and renewing the church. You can give to Centenary by dropping a check in the mail at P.O. Box 507, Lawton, Oklahoma, 73502, or by going to the church website, lawtoncentenary.org, and clicking on Give. You can also come by the church office or call 580-355-5660 to set up direct deposit. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Great God of wonderful surprises, we enter this season of preparation for your son's coming, looking not just for a memory of past events, but anticipating a return. We strive to get out of our lives in order and pray that our giving of ourselves to these preparations might reflect the earth-shaking importance of his coming. Help us to give ourselves generously, for we do not know the day or the hour. We pray in the name of the one who will come. Amen. Touching every heart, I 
this is incredible. This is the best. This is where I joined the church in this service. I know all of you are at home and we're live streaming, but this feeling that I have, I just have to share it with you and let you know that I am so thankful for you letting me use my prayers, my presence, my gifts, my service, and my witness to serve God's kingdom. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord of time and hope, we are rushing headlong into the holidays to come. We look at our calendars and our day planners and wonder how we will get everything done in the time allotted to us before the big day arrives. We begin to panic at the thought of projects still to be finished, contacts that need to be made, preparations for festivities that have only just begun and the darkness of the obsessive holiday planning overtakes us and clouds our minds and spirits. But you are a God of time and light. You bring us hope as you always have through the voices of the great prophets and now through the one who is to come, Jesus Christ. Remind us again what this season is truly about. Love, hope, peace, and joy. Calm us down. Slow us down. Help us remember that it is in loving relationship that you gave your son to us, and it is in loving relationship that your word is carried into the hearts of the people. No tinsel, ribbons, tape, cards could convey the eternal message adequately. You have given us the light the light to shine in our path and cut through our darkness. Shine in the hearts of your people today. Bless those dear ones whom we have named before you today with your healing, reconciling, comforting, peace, and love. Give us strength to face all the difficult situations and let your compassionate light shine on them guiding their decisions and their steps. Bring us at last to your presence, where the light of hope and love continually pour out on us. These prayers and hopes we offer in confidence and gratitude for your love and presence. Amen. Our scripture today comes from Mark 13, 24 through 37. But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that the summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or at Caught crow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Bob and Betty were two of my dearest friends, a strong, loving example of what a married couple should be. However, this couple was always at least 15 minutes late for everything, church, fellowship dinners, or parties, 
Bob contracted cancer and died. The funeral was to be in the church sanctuary. That afternoon, the funeral director came to the pastor's office all upset. Betty was outside in the limo and would not get out. The pastor went out to the limo expecting Betty to be upset, not wanting to accept the reality and finality of Bob's death. He pleaded with Betty to get out of the limo. She insisted she was not getting out. Finally, clenching her teeth, she looked at him and said, that man made me late for everything for 45 years, and I will not be late to his funeral. At an intersection, the green light changes to yellow. At a theater, the house lights flash. At a railroad crossing, the lights begin to flash. A car in front of you on the freeway turns on their signal that they're going to turn. A voice in the wilderness of Judea, a voice is heard declaring, prepare the way of the Lord. What do these have in common? They are all warning signs for which you need to be prepared. Today's scripture calls us to keep awake or in translation, be prepared, essentially for the second coming of Christ. To understand why, let me take you back to a time that was before the first coming of Christ. Jeremiah is such an important prophet who delivered God's word to the people of Judah and Jerusalem. It is told that he responded to Yahweh's, which is Hebrew for God, call to prophesy by protesting I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But he received Yahweh's assurance that he would put his own words into Jeremiah's mouth and make him a prophet to the nations. So, Judah had become a place that turned their back on God, on Yahweh. When Zedekiah had become their king, they were already worshiping false gods. See, Zedekiah was the last king to rule Jerusalem and Judea. But there was a series of kings leading up to, Je to Zedekiah. He preached to these people to repent, Jeremiah did, and to return back to God. Jeremiah pleaded with them, begging them, and that if they listened to God, that God would deliver them. All they had to do was turn back to God. They were worshiping these false gods who were husband and wife. The wife, Ashura, was the goddess of fertility. She was kept in people's homes and people would pray to her. She was kept in the high places in a figurine that was wood, stone, or metal. The kings were worshipers of Ashura. The kings believed that if they worshiped her appropriately, that they would bless the wombs of their wives and they would have children. She would bless the wombs of their livestock and they would have more lambs or more goats, whatever they were raising. It would also make way for temple prostitutes in Judah. And in scripture, we know that two of the rooms in the temple of Solomon were set aside and prostitutes were brought. And if you wanted to worship the God of fertility, that involved sexual rites, sexual acts in order to receive her blessings. Now, the God who was the chief of gods was Baal, and Baal means master, and Baal was the God of storms, God of rain. You see, Judah and Jerusalem was an arid area, and they believed that if all else failed, that they could worship these gods, and that these gods, Ashura would bring fertility, that Baal would bring the rain, and the storms, and the thunder, and like Ashura, Baal was put as a figurine and held in high places. And how people would worship Baal is they would bring burnt offerings and the smoke would rise to the clouds and that would signal that they are worshiping Baal. And Baal often was portrayed like this and that was because he would throw lightning bolts down at the ground and that was believed to bring the thunder and the rain. There was another name they called Baal, and that was Moloch. And Moloch was a god who demanded sacrifices. 
offered rain and offered blessings. And if you were in a period of drought and you had offered everything you could think of, the last thing you would want to offer is the thing that was the most important to you. And in this day and time, that was your firstborn. You see, Moloch was built of iron on the side of a hill. And what they would do is they could go inside Moloch and they would stoke a fire inside of him. And that would cause that iron to get hot. And on the side of the hill, Moloch's arms were stretched out like this. And the offerings were brought and placed in his hands as the fire would burn inside. And they believed that this would bring so much to their family, that they would believe that this would release the drought that they were going through. Whatever they could do to find something to believe in that wasn't of God, that's what they did. And that's because of the series of kings. So think about this. Judah and Jerusalem are in this area where they're no longer serving God. They're serving other gods. They're believing in these false gods. Ultimately, they would not listen to Jeremiah. Instead, the Babylonians would infiltrate and, and destroy the kingdom of Judah and the city of Jerusalem. You see, you have the Babylonians, and then you have Judah, and then you have Jerusalem. And what happened is that the Babylonians are becoming so strong and so powerful, they want to take over this land. And in order for them to do that, they begin to tax Judah and Jerusalem. And how they get the reaction from the Babylonians is that whenever they begin to head west, that at that point, there was a wall. And this wall was built to keep the Babylonians out. And eventually one day, the Babylonians break through this wall and they enter into the cities of Judah and Jerusalem because they're not paying their taxes. And the king tries to run away. The king goes out of the back. And while the king tries to escape, the Babylonians had become so powerful that they sent those that were infiltrating the cities to capture the king. And what ends up happening is they capture the king and they bring him all the way back to Judah. And there they make an example of him. They bring his family. And as they bring their fa <laughs> this family, they realize that the brothers are going, his, the king's brothers are going to be killed. And two of them are killed in front of the king as an example of what the Babylonians would do to get their power, to take hold of this land. Because you see, these, this land is a trade route. That's the reason why this land was so important, was because the Babylonians wanted to use this land as a way of getting to other countries. And as Judah and Jerusalem began to reject the Babylonians and not pay their taxes, that's when all of this became a problem. And so you think about this, in this area where everybody is not of God and everybody is worshiping other gods. So, in 586 BC, Judah, broken families, would have been ravaged by grief and loss. Those left behind would have had to scramble to find surviving relatives and a place to sleep if their homes had been destroyed. Produce and food animals were either destroyed or taken. Every object of value was plundered. Anyone with any authority or skill to help rebuild the society was dead or gone. Something happened in the United States that would be equivalent of what the people of Judah felt. On September the 11th, 2001, when the World Trade Center, the Twin Towers fell, 
in the Pentagon damaged by flights that were redirected by the Islamic terrorist groups, Al-Qaeda. You know where you were that day, and you know where your family was and the things that you were experiencing because that stopped everything. That made us pause and reflect upon how easily we could get hurt from others. Except we came together as a nation and as God's people, we did not fall, but we were made stronger because of what happened to us. The kingdom of Judah fell. The fall is similar in that everything that had been written up in scripture up to this point was so important in 587 BC that it was rewritten in the light of what happened here and everything else that happened after was shaped by what happened when the city of Jerusalem was destroyed and Judah fell. So I begin to think, how long as people of the earth have we been this way? How long have we dealt with destruction and painfulness and people of others that are not of us infiltrating and wanting things from us? How long have we reacted in such a way that would destroy? So the story in the Bible after the Garden of Eden, which is where Adam and Eve are expelled because they didn't listen to God and now we have sin in the world, is about their sons, Cain and Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. Abel's life was going well and Cain's wasn't going so well. The blessings of God for Abel and the lack of blessings for Cain. Abel brought his very best animals to sacrifice to God and Cain brought some of his grain, some. God accepted Abel's gift, but not Cain's. Abel brought his very best. This made Cain very angry and begins to build a resentment in Cain's mind and heart. He begins to channel this resentment towards his brother. So one day he invites his brother to walk in a field with him. There Cain attacks and kills his brother. Genesis chapter 4. Before this chapter is over, we meet Lamech, who is the father of Noah and is, and is from the family of Cain. He boasts about something that has just happened or he's making a promise of what will happen. Lamech says, I have killed a man who attacked me, a young man who wounded me. He says, if someone harms me, then I'm going to seek revenge to this person 77 times. I'm going to seek vengeance 77 times. Could you imagine if somebody were to look at you or if you were to say something that wasn't appeasing to them or if you weren't doing something that would continually lift them up into a light and shining them, that they would in turn come after you, that they would want to destroy you, that they would make threats to you, that they would say, because you reacted in this way, because you said these words, because these were your actions, the response that you're going to receive is that I'm going to come after you. Could you imagine being threatened like this, that somebody of this type of caliber would go through with these accusations, with these threats? So how many times is he going to seek vengeance? Hold on to that idea. You see, the words that we speak matter. You know that saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me? That's not true. Words can hurt us. Maybe you've said something to somebody and you didn't mean, or maybe you got a feeling about something and you shouldn't have. You say, I'm not going to get even, but I'm going to get ahead. This was the idea that Lamech had. So violence begins to erupt early in the book of Genesis. In God's sight, the earth had become corrupt 
and was filled with violence. Genesis 6, 11. Here God begins to baptize the earth by sending a flood to cleanse, to make clean and renew. Humanity is doing these horrible things to each other. God chooses Noah and says to him, I have, de- I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Noah builds the ark at God's request. Think about this. Noah is building in the middle of the desert. They hadn't seen rain. When David was in the lion's den, did he run? No, but he also didn't have a choice. God delivered him because he was faithful and trusting to God's word, to God's promise. Now we have the ark story about a flood that is coming to cleanse the earth. God is grieving the pain and violence that people are inflicting upon one another. One has to wonder whether God's instructions made any sense to Noah. God told him to build a gigantic boat far from the nearest body of water. And here we see Noah was obedient, even though God's instructions were hard to understand. This is one of the secrets of life. This is one of the secrets of life. We may not understand how everything works, but we must always be faithful to do what God tells us to do. When we walk by faith as Noah did, God will watch over us. Maybe you're not someone who has said something to someone that's hurt them. Maybe you're someone who has had something said to you. How are you going to respond? Will you seek vengeance? Or will you respond with grace? We were created in the image of God. This tells us several things. We are God's children. We belong to God. Now, if someone hurts my family, I take that personally. Because you're not only hurting someone that I love, but you're hurting someone that God loves. And God is not a God of confusion. God is sure of his decisions. God knows when he says something to you, what is to come. Let us think about that. We were created in the image of God. This tells us several things. We are God's children, and we belong to God. I take that personally, as I said, because they're hurting someone I love. We were created in the image of God. And God takes it very personally. We are all people of sacred worth and of sacred value, regardless of our decisions or our differences. So when you inflict pain upon another person, This inflicts pain upon God himself. We were created in the image of God. Our words can kill and destroy, or they can build people up. Something that I want you to know, and this is so important, is that the actions and the words of other people have nothing to do with you and everything to do with them. The way that you respond, the words that you speak, the actions that you take, they are a reflection of yourself. So let us be mindful of that as we prepare our hearts and minds for Jesus Christ. In October 2006, after a long shift at the fire department, 20-year-old Matt Swatzel fell asleep while driving and crashed into another vehicle. He awoke to the most awful sound, realizing he had crashed into June Fitzgerald, who was pregnant and with her 19-month-old daughter, Faith. Faith survived the crash, but her unborn child did not. Fitzgerald's husband, a full-time pastor, asked for the man's diminished sentence, saying, you forgive as you have been forgiven. He meets with the man who fell asleep at the will and killed his wife and unborn child regularly. He could have chosen to write a statement of impact about how this changed his life forever. 
But he chose to forgive this man. He chose not to let evil win. Genocide. I had to look this word up. Genocide. What does that mean? The deliberate killing of a large group of people, especially those of a particular ethnic group or nation. During the Rwandan genocide in the mid-90s, the entire family of a woman named Imakul was murdered in a massacre. In Rwandan, they, were, they separated people by the width of their nose, by the amount of space between their eyes, or by the length of their fingernails. Imakul chose to forgive the people behind the death of her family and went on to write a best-selling book entitled Left to Tell. She founded the Left to Tell Charitable Foundation in order to help children who have been orphaned due to geno genocide. She found God in the midst of her tragedy. He was with her from the very beginning and is the reason she chose to rise above what happened. The Rwandan genocide was over the span of 100 days and 800,000 people were killed. Rwandan's history was marred by a tragic cultural genocide, yet decades later, healing and reconciliation have begun throughout the country. This, an, this is an incredible reminder of the power of forgiveness, not only to heal, in, to heal individuals, but communities. Here we have stories where People have gone through a great difficult time of pain and their response speaks so true to who they are, to how God came into their lives and gave them the strength to overcome. Anita Smith and her husband Ronnie moved to Libya because they saw the suffering of the Libyan people. They saw their hope and they wanted to partner with them to build a better future. Anita said in a letter, Ronnie was a chemistry teacher in a Benghazi school. On December the 5th, 2013, Ronnie was shot and killed by an unknown gunman during his morning run. Anita addressed her husband's attacker in her letter saying, I love you and forgive you. How could I not? For Jesus taught us to love our enemies, not to kill them or seek revenge. The US Department of State website is a place where you can go to get the scoop on a place before you travel. They provide what's called a travel advisory level. There are four levels to which they classify. Level one, exercise normal precautions. Level two, exercise increased caution. Level three, reconsider travel and level. And level four, a do not travel. They knew how terrible the suffering of their people was, but they saw hope. They wanted to build a better future, and faith does not always take you out of the storm, but, ta but faith will calm you during it. One fateful day, Christy Jones received an email from a woman she had never met. You don't know me, but I am no longer dating your husband. I'm sorry for the, any pain I caused your family, the email read. I felt paralyzed, Christy said. She called her husband at work, and he eventually admitted that it was true. He had carried on a four-month affair with a woman he had met at work. Forgiving him was the hardest thing I've ever had to do, said Christy, but his honesty made it easier. The two later went on to renew their wedding vows, and Christy said that day, our marriage is stronger for it. I have no regrets. So here we have situations where the worst has damaged people, where people have lost, where people have been killed, where people have continued to have issues thrown at them, and they have to respond. I want to remind you of a question that I had in the very beginning. How many times does Lamech say that he's going to seek revenge? 
Emotions are God-given. Spontaneous responses to events. A person perceives an event in a particular way and an emotion is aroused. That leads to one of at least three responses. The emotion is allowed to escalate so that it becomes destructive to yourself or others. Its validity is denied or it is directed in a manner appropriate and healthy for the situation. Emotions themselves are neither good nor bad. The people or the problem lies in the thoughts that produce emotions and in behaviors resulting from emotions. Because they are spontaneous, emotions do not last for an extended period of time. They are nurtured by the mind and will. Emotions are a caution light, reminding us to re-examine what we are thinking. I hope that you thrive in the midst of your storm. I don't know what thriving will look like for you in this year of your life. I hope that it looks like peace. I hope that it looks like reading good books and having living room conversations in the middle of your uncertainty. I hope you notice you are thriving in the most subtle ways, even when it seems like nothing has changed. I hope thriving means saying something, means saying what the heart longs to say after finally realizing that you had made it a lot further than you gave yourself credit for. I hope you can keep that bold hope that there is more in store for you. I hope amidst your uncertainty that you keep courage to come alive again. The Apostle Paul said this, and it's a verse that we should memorize. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. Ephesians 4:29. We are to share the grace God offers us in the same way that God is kind and merciful to us. We are to be kind and merciful to others. No matter what anyone says to you, you return kindness. Something happens when you return kindness to evil. The other person is put to shame. The other person begins to feel guilty about what they did. Jesus said this, you have heard that it is said, you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you so that you will be acting as children of your Father in heaven. So you pray for your enemies and you love your enemies. This doesn't mean that you have warm, fuzzy feelings, but that you return kindness for the unkindness that you've been shown. This changes you and at least has the potential to change the other person. The Apostle Paul says this from Romans 12, 21. Don't be defeated by evil, but defeat evil with good. This is God's strategy. This is what Jesus calls us to do. Paul says from Ephesians 4, 31 through 32, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tender hearted, giving, forgiving one another. As God in Christ has forgiven you. They will know you are Christians, my disciples, by your love and forgiveness. Now Jesus is talking. My death on the cross was about forgiveness. The Son of Man came to earth and was crucified so that you could be forgiven. We are washed and made clean. You recite this so many times, but do you apply this to your life? Jesus says, pray like this. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But let us also not forget in that same prayer that it says, but deliver us from evil. We have a choice. You see, that's what this is Advent is about, is about preparing our hearts and minds for the coming, for the, se or for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And as Jesus comes, let us remember 
the reason of his first coming. He came to die for the forgiveness of our sins. One final thought. Simon comes to Jesus and he says, Hey, Jesus, I think I get your point. I think I understand. He asks this question, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother and sister who sins against me? How many times do I have to forgive these people who continue to do wrong? Should I forgive as many as seven times? I mean, that's awesome, right? You think about going through a situation where you've been wronged, where you've had issues thrown at you, and yet you ask, how many times should I forgive? Or maybe you're on the other side and you're, you want forgiveness. But let us also remember Advent is about preparing our hearts and minds about the situation that we're in right now, where what we've gone through is what we've gone through. I know people that have experienced loss. I know people that have had issues because of funerals during this pandemic and their family wasn't able to gather. I know of situations of people who have lost their job because of this pandemic. But I also know those that continue to rise above are those that don't give up. Those that continue to do what God has called them to do. In the midst of the storm, God may not always give you the best things to go through. But what I can tell you is that God will deliver you, but you must remain faithful to his word. So how many times does Lamech say he's going to seek vengeance to someone who has harmed him? 77 times he boasted. He was proud of that. And Jesus took that same idea and said, no. You're going to forgive 70 times seven. You're not going to say that it was okay or that it didn't matter, didn't hurt me. You're going to say that I choose not to seek vengeance. I choose not to get even. And I choose to show grace instead. Let us draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. I would like to invite you into a time of prayer. Let's go to the Lord. God of light, we give you thanks for the hope you have restored in us. Make us your light in a world of darkness so that we will always point to your presence. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. We join together for some closing song.
Now receive this benediction. May God bless you with discomfort. Add easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger. Add injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. Amen. The herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise Join the triumph of the skies With angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born of 
peace Hail the Son of Righteousness Light and life to all He brings Risen with Him in His wings Mighty lays His glory by Born that man no more may die Born to raise the sons of 